This piece is a perfect example of using the wrists to produce a warm sound and a natural legato. Let's take the first bar. As you see, the texture in the right hand consists of four double notes, and they are divided into two groups connected by slurs. If you approach it with a fixed wrist, even if you connect them correctly, it will more or less sound like this. In my opinion, there are two significant problems with this sort of attack or playing. It's difficult to control the sound, and the legato is quite artificial. Now, let's talk about the solution. I want you to try being super flexible with your wrist. When you press the keys at any moment, your wrist shouldn't be in a fixed position. There are two options. It could move downwards or upwards. In the first part, if we move downwards with the wrist and wait until the next double note, although it would sound better than the fixed option, we could not call it flexible, as we use force to keep it down. Instead, try this. Let's bounce on the first double note. Then, let's bounce again on the next one, but with a smaller movement. And as you can imagine, in the next two double notes, I will move downwards with the first and upwards with the last one. Now, let's one more time check the difference. Fixed wrist. Flexible wrist. As you've heard, we have a more natural connection between these double notes with flexible wrist. At this point, the voicing technique comes to the table. Let's take the first two bars. Imagine the upper layer played by a violin, the main melody. And for the bottom layer, let's assume it is played by a viola, as the secondary melody. Naturally, a little softer. And now, let's play them together. Try to lean slightly to the right, to add a little more weight on the main melody, and to have less weight on the viola. Well, for last time, I want to draw your attention to the difference between the first example and the last example. I recommend considering this approach from the very beginning when you start to learn the piece. Let's take a look at the next four chords. We still have the violin, but now there are two violas. Let's highlight the melody and the rest very soft. Also here, try to lean just a little bit to the right, and make sure to bounce on each chord for a nicer tone. This is the general idea for the right hand. Perhaps try to master this section first, and then you can implement the same wrist movements more comfortably to the entire piece. Now let's play the rest of the first phrase. Let's highlight the upper tone by a slight rotation, and let's keep the wrist very flexible. Alright, let's move on to the left hand. Beside accompanying, the left hand has one more important role here. It gives the waltz character to the piece. Therefore, we need to make the bass tone sound a little more significant, and the chords softer. Which helps us to create the rhythmical drive of the waltz character. One, two, three. One, two, three. We must be aware that the bass is a single note. If we approach the bass and the chords with the same kind of attack, there will be a balance problem, as there are three tones versus one. We must try to articulate all the chords very gently. Try to imagine all these three tones as one, as homogeneous as possible. Almost like you want to play them together, but with a slight wrist rotation, you play the arpeggiato. I search for a character that reminds the harp. Perhaps a double bass and a harp.
With the sustain pedal, it will sound even more like that. About the pedal, there is nothing too specific. I will change it mainly with the bass tones and also with harmonic changes. You can find the exact markings about pedaling in the sheet music I will include. Let's play the whole first phrase, only with the left hand. Alright, it's time to put them together. Beside all the details I've mentioned earlier, try to keep the left hand a little softer to present the right hand's melody with transparency. Let's move on to the second phrase. Nothing unexpected on the right hand here. The same principles for the wrist movements and the voicing remain. Let's first play the upper melody. Remember to use the actual fingerings. Now let's play the whole texture. The chords are more crowded here, so it requires special care to highlight the melody and to keep the rest softer. About the left hand, there are no arpeggios anymore. Try to expose upper tones here as well. They will certainly sound more special. The bass is still more significant. Alright, let's put them together. section, the first two phrases are repeated almost identically. Therefore, I will move on to the last section, which seems to be the technically most challenging part for me. I might have some solution to make it more comfortable. On the right hand, we have parallel double notes, which are required to be played legato and melodic. In this passage, switching the hand position between the second and the third double note is a little tricky, because it's almost impossible to keep them connected. But if we minimize the gap as much as possible, with pedals help it will sound just fine. The good news is that the wrist movement can be a lifesaver here. Take a look at this. Already while playing the first two double notes, I move my wrist towards the next position. I keep the fifth finger as long as I can before I play the next double note. If you switch the position with a parallel move, there will most likely be a much bigger gap. Also, there is a big chance of making an accent on the third double note. Both of these issues are against what Brahms is asking for. I suggest first practicing each layer separately. Brighter upper layer and softer bottom layer. Let's put them together. Now let's do it with the pedal. In the last bars we have a similar situation. The only difference is that we have to switch the position twice. Pretty much the same idea. With both position changes, I'll move my wrist towards the next position already in anticipation of the jump and keep the fifth finger as long as I can. Also here, practice the upper layer first.
Dat een meer softer. And then put them together. With the pedal. Now let me play the whole last phrase with the right hand. With the left hand, as I showed earlier, try to highlight the bass and the upper tone on the chords and play the arpeggios like a harp. Now let's put them together. All right, we have come through the whole piece. Now I want to say a few things about phrasing and timing. This is a piece from the Romantic period and the rubato is integral part of Brahms music. I want to show you how to implement this technique by stretching and compressing the timing to get a clearer expression of the phrases. Let's take the first phrase. It's fair enough to say that it is made out of two sub-phrases. The first one... and the second one. As you see, in the first subphrase we have a crescendo and decrescendo. What I like to do is to compress the timing with the crescendo. So I'll slightly accelerate to add a little excitement. And right after that I will stretch the timing by decelerating, which will calm it down. This is a straightforward way of implementing the rubato. If you stretch it, you must compress right after that, or the other way around. Of course, there can be exceptions, but in many cases, this is how it works. If you only rush or slow down without doing the opposite next, the general timing might not feel natural. In the second subphrase, there are three crescendi and decrescendi. In my view, the small ones are about the emphasis on the F minor chords. Maybe Brahms wanted something a little more special here. Let's bring it towards the chords, and then let's try to sit on them a little longer. And more excited. And calm down. Now let's take a look at the second phrase. I have slightly different suggestion here. As you see, the crescendo is a little longer. I like to compress the timing gradually towards the climax chord, but then I'll take my time right before the culmination and let it resonate a little longer. Which makes the climax harder to reach and precious. This is how I like to play around with the timing, and it helps me shape the phrases comfortably. Now I will play the whole piece for you and try to put all these details together. Let's go.
This was all for today's tutorial. I hope it gives you some idea on how to play these beautiful waltz. Let me know in the comments what else you'd like to hear from Brahms, and give me a like if you enjoyed the video. I'll see you in the next one. Later.